I was asking myself, like, what makes this guy care so much? And what gives him the confidence to think he can do something? Being a Jew is not this like secondary religious belief. It's the core identity of who I am. A lot of people say that the Jews are chosen. No, it's us that chose. If our goal is to heal the world and to enlighten everyone, I've never been a victim. And I will never be a victim because it's a mindset. If someone ever hits you, you hit them back. You stand up for yourself. You'd never be afraid. Never take off your Magan David. Never be afraid of who you are. For myself, I said, I was chosen for this. Chosen people is not the correct terminology. No. The Jewish people have not resolved our own trauma. Welcome, Rudy. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, obviously I've seen you around. I've seen you on uh, YouTube arguing with um, Palestinians or Arabs or pro-Palestinians for many years. Spreading light wherever I can. That's your way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard you uh, spreading light on, I think the podcast is called The Weekly Squeeze mm -hmm. or something. And um, there were, the way you were saying things made me want to get you on the podcast. So reached out to a friend who was able to get to you and here you are. That's right. So let's, uh, let's jump in. As I understood from that podcast, there are kind of three areas of focus for you right now in your life. You want to talk about those? Sure. I would, I would say there's usually five right now. Um, it's the empowerment and education of the younger generation of the Jewish people. I think a lot of us are taught to practice Judaism and not really how to put Judaism into practice, knowing how to stand up for ourselves, to debate, to do public speaking, to know all the counter narratives that exist against the Jewish people. So practical tools. Can you define younger? Um, I would say like, you know, 30 under Got because it. they're okay. the future. Um, and so it could be for middle school, for elementary, for high school, for college students. Um, but this is the target audience that I see as the next generation. Understood. Um, the second thing I would say is uh, dealing with anti-Semitism from the right to the left, wherever it exists. You've been busy um, with that lately. Yeah, there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of work to do with that. But again, it's also much more me metaphysical conversation as to why it even comes up every generation all the time uh, that we can get into. The third, I would say, it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Our goal as a people is to do tikkun olam and ola goim, to be a light upon the world and to heal the different nations that are in problems. So why don't we do tikkun babayt mabne dodim? Like if our goal is to heal the world and to enlighten everyone, then why don't we what heal? What is that, tikkun babayt? Tikkun babayt mabrindodim. Babayt is in our own home. Right. How don't we heal our own home with our cousins before right. we talk about healing the rest of the world with the rest of the nations? Okay. You know, right. so definitely we need it's to take the people who want to change the world without working on themselves Nahon. or exactly. their family. So Got we it. need to work on our own home first. Uh, so Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, I would say also that there's no vision or next direction that our generation has as a Jewish people. You know, we're here because we're the lucky ones that survived after thousands of years of persecutions that we've been through wherever we've lived. And each generation had a goal of moving forward. Uh, I would say in 1948, it was to come back to the land of Israel to revive our civilization. Then it was to go to, to Jerusalem uh, to get out of certain traumas that we're facing, coming to the land of Israel way right, before. So now that things are okay, we don't have a clear goal. Yeah, we don't have the next step. Right, we, we don't fought have... to get here. Yeah. Now we're here. Now we're here. Now what? Now what? That's the conversation we need to have, and that's the, the answers we need to start finding. And I would say the last one is uh, bringing the, an awareness to all the tribes of Israel, many of the disconnected communities, whether in Africa, in Asia, in South America, and to bring them back to the conversation in order for us to unite. So those are the five things that I focus those on. Those are your five areas of focus. Okay. Now, on the podcast, you had mentioned something, or maybe I heard this somewhere else, about an incident that happened when you were... Uh, seven years old. Do you consider yourself a victim of anti-Semitism? And can you talk to that story? Um, I don't want to consider myself a victim. Have I ever gone through anti-Semitism? Plenty. Um, but I don't look at it as I'm a victim. I would look at it as this taught me a lesson to empower me. So to go backwards before that seven-year-old experience, um, I was born in France. I moved to Israel when I was three, then to Miami when I was five. And being here in Miami, I'm sure you know that no one really identifies as American. You're Argentinian, Venezuelan, Colombian, Haitian, Jamaican, Puerto Rican, Cuban. Or and, New Yorker, but right. no one identifies as coming <laughs> exactly. from Miami. No one, no one, no one sees <laughs> themselves as really American-American. And when I grew up, I was always labeled the French kid because that's where I was born. In Miami. Uh, in Miami. But both my parents were first generation born in France. It's not really our homeland. That's not really right, our exactly. country. All of my grandparents were born in different countries. And so when I go to France to visit my family, I was considered the American cousin. And so it's like, hold up, like here I'm French, here I'm American, here I'm that. So apparently yes. who I am depends on who's asking me the question or where the question is being asked. And from there, I wanted to find my own answer. And I had this experience as a seven-year-old. We went to London with my mom, my younger brother. We got onto the red tour bus that does a tour London. And my mom was wearing a shirt in Hebrew. And as we got onto the bus, the bus driver who ends up being a neo-Nazi sees my mom's shirt and says, excuse me, is that written in Jewish? 
And she's like, uh, no, it's written in Hebrew, but it's the language of the Jewish people. It's like, oh, so you guys are Jews. And she's like, yeah, well, what's the problem? She's like, get off the bus. And my mom's like, I don't know who you think you are, and we're not getting off this bus. And he got up, grabbed my mom, and threw her off. And that moment really changed my life. It made me realize that it didn't matter where I was born, grew up, lived in, traveled to, resided in, what passport I have, where my parents or grandparents were born. I was a Jew, which made me realize that being a Jew is not this like secondary religious belief. It's the core identity of who I am. It's my ancestors. It's my descendants. And the second thing it did for me is it made me promise that the next time I would deal with any form of darkness in this world, any form of injustice, especially against the Jewish people, that I'd have to be prepared. And that's what would eventually activate me to becoming an activist. So this guy was, um, this, this bus driver was more than just, he was like a teacher. He was an ignition. He yeah. taught you your purpose. Hon. He like, he fired up a Jew. If only he's listening. <laughs> he's you have to have a, a, a very <laughs> macro view to be able to understand that, but I would agree. Right. It's like uh, the guy who sexually abused me as a kid, like he fired me up like a mofo. <laughs> I don't think it was his intention, but, and in his case, he was a kid. Um, but in years, the guy had a specific intent probably to put... Jew down and may, Jews, Jews down, and in other cases it might have worked. But in your case, was there a period? Because I do talk a lot about healing and trauma and those kind of topics. On this, was the was there a period of time where this incident was more difficult for you, where it brought up fears or where you were afraid to walk outside? Was there? No, I wouldn't say. In the moment, I didn't have fear. In the moment. I just didn't have the ability to do something. I didn't know what to do. Of course, as a seven-year-old, I wouldn't mind going and, you know, physically confronting the guy, but I'm smart right. enough to understand that that wouldn't work. It wouldn't do anything to, the, to fix the problem. So in my mind, I had to go get help. Eventually, the police came. The guy got arrested. But I promised myself I'd never want to be in a situation again where I don't know what to do. I want to be mentally prepared. That was the prepared. immediate aftermath? Aftermath. I will, I will never not be prepared. I will never not know how to answer or deal with the situation. So did you start working Mentally, out? physically, I started uh, martial arts. One did Kav Maga and then did the army in Israel. Um, you know, I wanted to prepare myself emotionally, physically, mentally, intellectually, even ideologically, understanding why these things were happening in the first place. Why does this per person even have a problem with me? And how can I do something in order to make sure not to be in that situation again? And then it evolved to realizing that this wasn't only me that's the target, it's, it's any Jew. And then realizing that most Jews are not prepared to Where deal with such a situation. Happened? In London. In London. Interesting. Because I spent time in um, Manchester, England, and I experienced so much anti-Semitism in England. I don't know what it is. But there was one incident that really changed me. Where I was probably about 18 or 19. And at the time, I was working out plenty. I wasn't afraid of a fight, uh, necessarily. And it was actually two on three. We were three, and it was two guys who jumped out. Two guys and one girl, but the girl only spoke. And... We're walking home from a wedding, a few friends, and a car pulls up, and the girl says, good evening, Jewish bastards, and two guys jump out, and one of them punched my friend right in the face. And we fought them off, and they ended up running away, but the, what, what changed me about that incident was seeing the hate that they had f for me. I had, I'd grew up in, grown up in Brooklyn, and it wasn't uncommon to get taunts or comments or things like that. That was, maybe even someone would throw something at you, but to see someone who never met me, who hated me, or who, would, it's hard to punch someone in the face. It's not an easy thing to do. And to be able to just punch my friend in the face because the only thing they knew about him was that he was Jewish, that changed me. I, I wondered a lot about um, anti-Semitism after that, but go back to... Yeah, I mean, I saw it the same way. I realized, okay, this person that just kicked me and my mom off doesn't know who we are. He doesn't know what we stand for. He doesn't even know if we keep kosher, if we do Shabbat, if we believe in God. All he knows is that we're Jewish. And that's when I realized that he doesn't hate us for who we actually are. Because if he knew who we are, he would actually like us because my family is a great family. right? He knows us by what someone told him Jews are. And clearly this guy has a lot of pain in him that the way to externalize that pain is by pinning it on a group of people that he was told is the right. cause of that pain. And that's what got me to ideologically understand where this is even coming from and how to position ourselves in order to overcome it. And how do you, and what do you think that is? What is the... So there's the there's the like practical answer and there's the more metaphysical answer the practical answer is that it's very clear throughout jewish history we have thousands of years of history as as a case model um that whenever we're strong we're united we're empowered we're fulfilling our purpose that we overcome all the greatest traumas all the greatest nations and civilizations that have tried to destroy us and whenever we're divided assimilating forgetting who we are we go through the worst of consequences and the worst of traumas so if and we look at it in this period of history right now we're completely divided, completely have no purpose, 
assimilating and that's exactly when you have the rise of anti-semitism and of course imagine you have a group of people who truly hate the jews of course they're going to rise when the jews are afraid of doing anything about it and as they get more and more within pop culture and educate more people jews are not doing anything so they're allowed to stand up they're allowed to rise up they're allowed to take more power but seeing now as having a land of israel and a strong state and the recognition that from a practical standpoint a lot of people recognizing that israel is strong how does that jive with anti-Semitism in, in this day and age? Well, we do have Israel that could potentially defend the Jewish people from a potential Holocaust or something like that that would happen. So it does put another barrier of possibility, which is why actually most anti-Semitism today is catered against Israel, right? Because if you put yourself in the shoes of an anti-Semite and you truly want to wipe out the Jewish people, the first thing you want to do is to wipe out their source of power, security and safety, which is Israel. So that's why we see now a lot of shift of anti-Semitism having the form of anti-Zionism and being anti-Israel and blaming everything on Israel, whereas before it was only blamed on the Jews, it still is, but now it's shifting there. But there's also a metaphysical reason as to why anti-Semitism happens. And so I've been asking myself for, for many years, like, why are the Jews always hated, right? When it comes to different minorities, like who usually hates women? It's usually men. Who usually hates people that are of color? It's usually white people that are white supremacists. Who usually hates the left? The right. Who usually hates the right? The left. It's usually like one group from the other side that is right. targeting. Not always. There's some individuals here there but it's usually that for the jews it's someone seeing themselves as the opposite to them. yeah but for right. the jews it's, it's all everyone. groups the far right sees the jews as the left the far left sees the jews as the right the farrakhans the more black supremacist side see the jews as the problem the white supremacists see the jews as the problem the communists right. blame the jews for being the capitalists the capitalists blame the jews. it's literally every single extreme group of any society it doesn't mean the majority of the people it's right. the extremes get to one conclusion that is the same and that the jews is the problem so i'm asking myself okay what is the cause we, we didn't create uh, the economic situation post World War One leading to the Holocaust. We didn't create the economic situation in Spain leading to the Inquisition. We didn't kill Jesus for us to be blamed on that. We didn't uh, do the Black Plague for that to be blamed on us. We didn't create COVID for that to be blamed on us. You know, Ukraine has nothing to do with Israel for it to be blamed and compared to Israel. Like, why is literally every bad thing in this world that's happening somehow being compared to the Jewish people in Israel? And I'm asking myself, okay, there's logical reasons that I've heard presented. Some people say, oh, well, it's because Jews are successful and people are jealous of the Jews because of your success so are others right if you look at the uh recent immigration groups that are come to america that are the most successful it's koreans indians and uh and chinese right and uh and also nigerians and so no hate group is really going against those communities at least not anywhere near the level against the jewish people you go to new york city 13 percent of the population is jewish over 56 percent of the total hate crimes are against jews right. so this like success thing maybe some may be jealous but it doesn't equate to how much suffering we go through. The next argument is that we other ourselves. You know, we have our own Jewish community centers, our own uh, synagogues, our own cemeteries, our own like everything. And because we other ourselves, that's why society rejects us. Well, I know plenty of mosques for Muslims Correct. that are separate or the, the Tibetans that have their own communities, Armenians, the Amish, for example, Correct. no one's going after the Amish because they have their own communities. So again, that's also- And if there are, you're saying it's not at the level that they are. And if there just... are individuals, it's not at the same level right. for that to be an actual reason for why there's this much anti-Semitism. The last logical answer that people usually give is that it's because we are uh, have a dual loyalty, right? We're part of this country, but we're loyal to another people, we're loyal to another country. But I know plenty of people who come from all sorts of countries who come to this country mm -hmm. are proud of the opportunity of living here, but still identify as being from their country, especially in Miami, right? All the Haitians are proud of being Haitians, Jamaicans sure. proud of being Jamaicans, Cubans, Cubans proud of being Cubans, culture. right? Argentines proud of, no one is going to those communities and say, oh, you have dual loyalty. Right. right. So again, this is not something that you can really equate to why there's so much hatred and rejection towards Jewish people. So I'm asking myself, okay, if we didn't create all these problems in this world and you know, maybe it's not something we're doing. Maybe it's something we're not doing, that the world is experiencing us as the source of the problem. And what is it that we're supposed to do that we're not doing? And so if you look at the mission statement of the Jewish people, right, a lot of people say that the Jews are chosen. No, it's us that chose. There was a responsibility that was offered to the whole world, and we chose to accept it. And that responsibility and mission statement is tikkun olam and ola goim. So you're saying the world. chosen people is not the correct terminology. No, we chose. We made that choice. Right? This was a choice that we made to accept this purpose. And what is that purpose? To heal the world and to empower the other nations. So let's say the world is a body. 
right? And every nation has its own function, purpose, and it's not binary. One nation can choose the role of three functions. Uh, you know, th sure. three nations can share two and one. It could be a variety of different things. What within the human body serves the function of healing the body and empowering the other organs and functions to work? I'm asking you, what in the human body well, does I've heard that? you talk about this. Okay. I'm not sure so, what I said. The so, immune system, I've heard. Exactly. It's so a good analogy. I, I came to the understanding that it's actually the immune system. The immune system's responsibility is to heal the body and to empower the other organs to work. So when the immune system doesn't work, doesn't fulfill its role, right, the body gets sick. And all the other organs don't have a conscious understanding as to why they just, they're being sick. They're blaming the immune system for the cause of it. So in my opinion, the reason there's anti-Semitism, it's a rejection of the Jewish people failing to fulfill their purpose and assimilating into being everyone but themselves. And that we're being blamed for the problems that exist, not because we created it, but because everyone feels we had a responsibility to prevent it in the first place. So you're viewing um, anti-Semitism through the lens of personal responsibility? Yes. Okay, so what do you do about it? What do I do about it? What do others... Well, individually, I think every person needs to understand that the reason they see problems in this world, right, we all see different problems, is because that's a reflection from their neshama, from their soul that is communicating to them through their eyes that this is something you need to fix. A lot of people walk day to day and look at a problem and are like, oh, I kind of feel something, but I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to ignore it. No, every single problem that you see, wherever there's a problem more than you feel, go out of your way to go and spread light where there's darkness. Go out of your And is this a message specifically to Jewish people or is this a message to everyone? I think Jewish? this is a message for, for everyone but the Jewish people took a commitment to do it as a collective. Now, again, it doesn't mean another collective can't take on this mission too. So a, Jew who, would say, a Jew who would say, I didn't take this on, you want to talk to me about a story from 3,000 years ago? We, well, the, way, the Jewish way of looking at it is that our souls are the same souls. So we did take that commitment. Even though we're in different vessels, those souls, those, that commitment, that promise, we were there and we made that promise. So you're saying that that's a truth and you can fight it, but it's the truth. I'm saying this is what I believe, and you can disagree with it, but at the same time, history proves a clear equation that when the Jews right, are in this position, we overcome and we go through miracles, and when we don't, we get persecuted irrationally in something that doesn't make sense. It's not that there were no challenges. Like, for example, the Jews left Egypt at the height of their strength. There was the Amalek, which attacked them. So, you, so you're saying what, that, they, that we... We, I guess we won in that well, case. We didn't have to have Amalek attack us. We didn't have to have Amalek win uh, certain battles. We didn't have to have the uh, different, you know, Edomites win in, in their battles. But there were certain strategies that they made. You know, you're going biblically. We can talk about that. You know, when the Jewish people were kind of going and, and sleeping with women to the side, then their spiritual power went down and that left them vulnerable to be attacked. So whenever we were attacked, it's always a consequence of either us being divided, not fulfilling our purpose, going against who we are and what we're supposed to do. And those are the moments where we become vulnerable to attack. And the moment where we become miraculously impenetrable is the moment when we're united, empowered, and fulfilling our purpose. I actually want to shift gears on the conversation. Um, more towards the, I want to say the, the topics I typically talk about. So someone goes through a trauma, either the Jewish people collectively going through a trauma. There's been uh, a lot recently, right, with anti-Semitism has, has uh, gotten a lot of um, attention and noise right now, especially with very popular people making comments that either are or questionably anti-Semitic. And then there's your personal experience at, at seven years old. When... To, to make that shift from victim, which I saw you reacted when I said that, are you a victim of anti-Semitism? Do you consider yourself? And you said, no, I'm not a victim. To make that shift from victim to personal responsibility, how did you make that shift? Were there specific steps you took? It's something that I focus a lot on as well, whether it's abuse or addiction or something else, the question always shifts back to even abuse as a child. It's, yeah, we can take this approach of, it happened to me, woe is me, or it happened to me for some specific purpose. And this could be insensitive when it's shared with someone else. But for myself, I said, I was chosen for this. There's something that um, I could do about this topic. Obviously, I have to heal it. I always have to pay attention to it. It's not a, uh, have you heard the term spiritual bypass? Mm -hmm. I don't get to use this as a way to ignore it. I definitely have to uproot and clean out the infection that this experience left with left me with, but I'm not a victim to it. Um, this something on some level, I like to say that if I was writing my book, I would include those chapters in there. If I was given authority over my story, I would include those chapters in there because it made me to some degree who I am and it charged me with a certain mission saying, hey, I can speak out about sexual abuse or I can understand um, 
pain in ways that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. So while I don't know all pain, I do know pain. While I don't know all trauma, I do know trauma. And it gives me a certain purpose and mission and, and focus. How did you make that shift from those experiences? Um, and I would argue that had you not made the shift personally, you would not be able to message it on a collective level. So do you recall how you, how you did that? I want to give credit where credit is due. I was raised by two very powerful and strong lions, both of my parents, that raised me to be an empowered individual. I never had to make that shift. That was completely normal for me. That's how I saw the world. Um, also, the reason my parents named me Rudy, it's a story of a Holocaust survivor that as Jews were assimilating, as anti-Semitism rose, he fought assimilation. Many Jews were blaming him, saying, if you would just assimilate more and be German, then we wouldn't be hated. Uh, and then eventually went and fought Nazis and became a partisan fighter. And then came back after the war, saw that his entire family was killed and brought hundreds of uh, orphans that were Jews uh, back to the land of Israel. So that is the story of my name. That's why that's the name that I was given from birth that completely changed the course of my life. The name that you have is very powerful. And my Hebrew name is Israel, right? Wrestling with the concept of a higher power for the sake of growth and also the connection to the land. So those things, plus the way that I was raised, gave me abilities to overcome those situations and not have to say, okay, now I'm a victim. How do I go from being a victim to no longer a victim? I've never been a victim and I will never be a victim because it's a mindset. And to a lot of people that are victims, when you talk about empowerment, right? Victim empowerment to to them, it sounds like victim blaming because they're in the mindset that they must remain victims in any conversation that they have any form of responsibility to do something to no longer be a victim to them sounds like victim blaming. But we have to understand our uh, ancestors have been through a lot of trauma, especially the Ashkenazi side of the experience of our people. And so there's a lot of trauma there that we have to overcome in order to come back to who we are. You, I guess you alluded to some of that um, in the story with your mother that she was she didn't get off the bus when she was asked to. Yeah. She had to be forcefully thrown off. Yeah, she, for, she, she for her, it's like completely normal. My parents told me if someone ever hits you, you hit them back. You stand up for yourself. You'd never be afraid. Never take off your Magan David. Never be afraid of who you are. So it's not like I was raised with being a victim, went through that, and had to go through an evolutionary process of no longer being a victim. I've never been a victim my whole life. Okay, so let's, so let's get to the second part of the equation because earlier you said that the Jewish people... Like now we're in a space of things are certainly better. We have our land, uh, we have our strength, we have a way to defend ourselves in many ways, and many of us live a live beautiful lives or have the opportunity to live beautiful lives. We live in uh, free countries, et cetera, et cetera, right? Although some of that seems to be becoming less popular of late. But certainly for the last number of years, we've lived in a relative uh, prosperity. At the same point in time, um, you refer to us as purposeless or... Right, that right now the Jewish people don't have a, a purpose. So going back to your personal story, after you have that experience, you can easily brush it off and say, okay, this is not a victim of anti-Semitism. Um, this is not a big deal. Where does the fire come from to, to, to care? Because that's something that's unique, and that's actually what impressed me when I was listening to your, you on the podcast. I, I, was, I was asking myself, like, what makes this guy care so much? And what gives him the confidence to think he can do something about it? Do you know where that came from? Yeah, so first of all, I don't think we're purposeless. I think we have a purpose. We're just not doing it. When I say purposeless, we don't feel the right. purpose. Right, we're not, we're not doing it. And individuals do it, but we don't do it as a collective. So you can see like the Einsteins and the Freuds and these like brilliant people, even the Zuckerbergs who create technology, shift the world the way it works. But we're not harvesting and using that energy, that power, that brilliance as a collective to bring lights to this world. Not just to succeed in your own space and to be profitable and to get very rich, but to use that strength to collectively fix the world and we're not doing that and that's what, what would I that think. look like um again our purpose Wait, before before we go there <clears throat> yeah uh, so fine so that's for those people on the purposeless and in terms of you feeling the confidence and strength and purpose to do something about it so again it started very young for me because i was asking myself who am I? Where am I from? I know that I'm from Israel. I know that I'm a Jew before everything else. It's been always very clear to me, but how do I express that to others? Because I'm always moving around to new places. I have to introduce myself to new friends, to new communities, wherever I go. What do I say when I'm introducing myself? Um, and that then shifted to understanding who I am and then asking myself, okay, well, what role does that people have and why are we being treated that way? And that evolved to me realizing, okay, our people have a purpose that we've been running away from. Our people are sometimes weak when we could be strong and I have to play a role to wake us up. So it was just an understanding of what my soul came on this earth to do. 
And that wasn't, that did not come to you through struggle. That was just naturally. It, I would say it came before the struggle. The struggle made it clear. When, what was the struggle? The struggle was the first experience with anti-Semitism at age seven, other experiences afterwards. But that made what I felt I already knew very clear. It like affirmed everything that I already believed, but didn't really know how to say things, how to act on it. But I've always felt it from birth, right? That I have a responsibility in this earth to help the Jewish people. And how, how young did you start your activism? I would say from age seven, it started. Really? Um, yeah. Whenever what did it look like at that age? Uh, at that age, it meant conversations with your friends and explaining to them that we're all from Israel and that we're Jewish people and that, you know, we have to remember who we are and not pretend to be, you know, in Miami, you have uh, the Jewish Community Center, you have the uh, JCC and they have Maccabi games and you have Team Argentina, Venezuela, Panama. And so I would literally go to all my friends like, you're not Panamanian. Panama was an experience. You're not Argentinian. Argentina was an experience. So it started that way in high school, storing parties, uh, all the money that was raised I was sending to Israel to different places. All of my quote unquote birthday parties, you know, when you're little and you do birthday parties, when people would give gifts, I would ask them to always make it as a donation to a cause in Israel. So that's always how it was for me. And at 17, left and joined the army and it continued and evolved from then. Got it. I'm sure you've identified and I see it this way that for the most part, most young people do not see any purpose. And the other side of the purpose, which is, is the sense that I matter and I can do something about it. Like that, that confidence that I could do something about it. You agree with that, right? That yeah. most young people do not. Um, young and old. I'd say most people in general. Yeah. Unless there is a specific, uh, I never articulated this way, but unless there is a specific struggle, then it seems like the purpose disappears. Okay, I got to fight out of poverty. As soon as that happened, all of a sudden it was like, okay, what do I do now? And the amount of people who say, don't sell your company because when you sell your company, you have nothing to do. Really? You know the amount of things I want to do, and if I I've tried to sell my company a number of times, for whatever reason it hasn't hasn't worked in my case, and I keep getting pulled back there. How would you address it? What would you? Well, I'll, I'll put it this way: um, I try to put tefillin every single morning, and when I do that, I do it as a form of Jewish meditation. I focus on what I'm thankful for in this world. A lot of people don't realize, you know, some people can't see, some people can't walk, some people lose their whole family, and those are things that we have and we should be thankful for every single day. And then I ask myself, what are the problems in this world that I see? What are the skills that I have, and how can I use those skills? to solve those problems. And we need to realize that not everyone is going to be an activist for Jewish rights, 100%. right? Some people care about the environment and pollution and animal rights. Some people care about psychology and dealing with people's traumas. Some people care about technology and making this world an easier place, right? People care about medicine. We all go to different places because we feel that our neshama, our souls are brought to this world to create a tikkun, a healing, a fix, a fulfillment. And so we just have to be in tune with what that is. And I don't think you ever get to the answer really for the most part if you're not asking yourself the question you have to ask yourself the question why was my soul here why do i see problems over there when someone else doesn't see problems there what are the skills that i have in order to use that to go there or skills that i can acquire public speaking is not something that i'm naturally good at i'm actually very introverted as a person so i had to develop the skills to do public speaking granted the fact that i've had to travel and spoke languages and meet new people allowed me to develop out of my shell but those are skills that i developed right so even the skills that you're born with doesn't mean that I that's all what you can access. You can develop other skills in order to be able to fix the problems that you see and also be in tune that those problems might change as time goes. You might see new problems. Those problems might be looked at from a different perspective. So be open to the evolution of understanding, but have your eyes open. I'll just, just something on public speaking, because I too had a very intense fear. What we're doing right now was a terrifying thought for me at some point. So one thing I've thought about is that there are certain people who when they speak, it's with intention. It comes from somewhere deep inside them. So if someone is sharing a thought that came from deep inside them and it's not heard or not received, the rejection is from, of something deep inside them. Oftentimes we see people who will call the gift of the gab. They're very comfortable. They can make superficial conversation very easily. Their words aren't necessarily coming from deep inside them. Their words are coming from I don't know, from the tongue, right? It just kind of slides like, you know, this is what I've said before and I'll say it again. And that rejection isn't full. If they don't get well received, good, they'll go to the next person. So oftentimes it's the people who, because no one's born with the fear of public speaking. That's something that's developed later, right? If uh, my child at six months had a fear of public speaking, I wouldn't know to give him a bottle.
Yeah, or they wouldn't <laughs> cry in front exactly. of everyone. Right. So it's somewhere later, right? And I think that's what it is, is certain people have intention when they speak and there's a sense of rejection that they get, not necessarily on purpose, but they really thought of something to say. They said it. Parents didn't hear it. Now, the next time, that becomes a more difficult experience for them. So what I'm, my message is to those people who have the fear of public speaking is they may have something really important to say. They may be exactly those people who have something really important to say, and that's how they develop the, um, the fear. But again... I would say that there's another thing that I think is very important that we don't even learn in education is tools for communication. And that means that let's say you're speaking to an individual to be aware of how they view the world, how they see truth already to be true. And then when you communicate to them, you're maybe speaking English as the same language, but you're using a different language of choice of words and picturing things in order for the person to understand. So whenever you're in a relationship, let's say with a partner or a child or a parent or a businessman or whatever it is that you have around you, you have to also understand who that person is, what worldview they have, what traumas they have, what are their values to tune the language and the choice of words that you have for them to truly get what you're saying. The point of speaking to someone is not to just regurgitate the information you have in your mind. You can go do that in the mirror. The point is to truly get that person to understand you. But for you to get there, you have to understand them in order to unlock that. What is the collective, the collective healing um, of the Jewish people to you look like? Well, we have to get over a lot of our traumas um, individually, but mainly also collectively. Um, I don't think we've gotten over the trauma of the Holocaust at all. You know, the Hebrew perspective of going through our traumas is reliving them, right? We create these holidays to relive those traumas. Avadim ha'inu, slaves we were. Like right. we went through Egypt. We were the Maccabees. We were in, in, in Persia. We, we were over, over there. We say right? the story. We, exactly. We, we see ourselves as we are those ancestors that are living here today. And this is our story. This is where we messed up. Right? We're very critical of ourselves. The Torah is the only religious book that criticizes its own people. Right, And this is what we've had to overcome. And this was the solution. And this was the lesson. Now, the Holocaust can arguably be one of the worst traumas the Jewish people have ever been through history. We've memorialized it. We light some candles. We bring a speaker. We watch a movie. Uh, we make a post. We say never again. But we don't really go through and live and see, say that wasn't just our grandparents' generation. That was us. This happened to all of us, our grandparents and us, that DNA, that so trauma. What would that look like practically? If I'm inspired by your words, what am I doing? Well, does anyone study what happened before the Holocaust, really? Of like why Hitler took power and how he was successful in doing it and how the Jewish people were? You know, and I'll, I'll give you an example. For me, when I came to campus, uh, I started at UCLA before transferring to Columbia in 2013 after the army. And this is when I realized that there was a growing movement of anti Israel anti-Semitism on campuses and I went to the leaders in Los Angeles at the time and asked them listen why are we only doing events in the Jewish safe spaces like why are we going out to the campus creating coalitions speaking you mean you don't want to hear about black rights from KKK members you don't want to hear about women rights from people who are misogynists why are the only people talking about Israel and the Jewish people are anti-Israel and anti the Jewish people and what they told me was don't worry about it it'll go away if you do something it'll just get worse no no don't worry like they're just being ideological while they're on campus eventually they grow up and they realize that there's a real world Clearly, we see that that's not the case. And that experience with these leaders telling me this reminded me of something that I had read when I did the trip called March of Living, a trip that I recommend every Jew to do when you're young, when you're old, it doesn't matter when, where you get to go to Poland and experience some of the concentration camps and learn a little bit of the history of what happened there. And on this trip that I took, it was when I was in senior year of high school in 2011, they gave us a packet of letters on the bus, letters written by different Jewish leaders at the time in the decade leading to the Shoah, meaning it didn't happen overnight where Jews are a part of society and the next day they're being killed. There was a rise in, in levels of anti-Semitism. What were the Jewish leaders saying to each other at the time? Don't worry about it. It'll go away. If you do something, it'll just get worse. You even had Jews making the argument, yeah, maybe Hitler wrote Mein Kampf while he was in prison, but that was just a crazy period in his past. Anyways, he's going to be the leader, so might as well support him. You had Jews making the argument wow. they had to financially support Hitler to create relations with him. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves years later, right, having said never again every single year, at least once, if but not, not twice a year, how we got but there. not actually putting into application to make sure and understand how do we get here, right? Anti-Semitism rises. We let that happen, right? If we could have created the state of Israel after the Holocaust with 6 million dead, with millions more in despair, with all the things that were taken from us, you don't think we could have done it before? 
right? right. When <laughs> clearly throughout history, when Jews are united, empowered, and fulfilling their purpose, we overcome all the greatest of traumas, including the Holocaust afterwards, and then going and creating the state of Israel. And when we look at the Jewish people, how they were before, they were completely divided, right? Uh, reform, Orthodox, fighting each other, completely assimilating, right? Going at people like the person that I have my name from and saying, you want to be Jewish? If you were just become more German, we wouldn't be attacked. And it's because of people like you that were being persecuted, right? And so that was our mentality and mindset. So of course we didn't stand up for ourselves. Of course we didn't do anything. And I have enough respect for the Jewish people. And I, I love the Jewish people to a point and I hold them on such a standard that I believe we could have prevented something like that from happening. And so many, you know, I made a comment like this and so many people came after me. This was, uh, you know, Purim last year. And they're like, how could you blame us on the Holocaust? And say, I didn't blame the Holocaust on us. It's not us this that made the Holocaust. Responsibility. It's us right. that have a responsibility to prevent that from happening. What's the point of saying never again? If we don't even know what we're saying if, never again if to. It's a commitment, right? It's not just a, a word that comes out of your mouth. It's a promise that each generation we make sure doesn't happen again. And this persecution, you think it started with the Holocaust? It happened many times before. When are we going to learn that lesson? We should have known it before the Holocaust. We should have right. done something to prevent it. And yes. I'm thinking while you're talking is about the, One more point uh, because ahead. it's important to add this. Yes, there were also Jews who stood up, right? There was people who fought back, but too little and too late. Right. There's, as you're talking, I'm thinking about at least the way the, the message of Hanukkah was communicated to me and the lesson that we always learned, you know, growing up Chabad where there's a lot of outreach and... Hanukkah was Jewish pride, right? It was Pride uh, Pride Week, right? We stood out there with the menorahs and everything else. And where was I? Where? I think it was, um, so visiting my grandparents in, um, in France, I was always told, you know, wear a baseball cap. Don't wear your, keep outside, show hate. And it was so different than what, I, what we did in Brooklyn. You know, there was like, hey, massive Jewish pride and the menorah and, the message that that sent, that there was a period of time where they came after us and we're, we're lighting this menorah, not in the house, at the window. Everyone should see it. Even keep I didn't wear a keep up for many years. But two years ago, I saw a politician, I think it was in New York or California, there was some anti-Semitism right around a few months into COVID. There were some things happening. And uh, someone said, well, maybe Jews shouldn't make themselves so obvious. Yeah, well, you know what to say to that? We should be afraid of what happens when Jews are afraid. Right. That's what we should be afraid of. Right, immediately after that is when I put on my uh, my kippah because that's that's an insane uh, insane message. So you're saying that? Do, do you agree with me on the message of Hanukkah that it's some in some sure. way communicated a certain Jewish pride and Jewish, Jewish empowerment, Jewish... The overcoming yeah. of you know Hellenistic periods of assimilating and the Greeks coming and miracles of light and Maccabees being strong. I mean, when I think of a Jew, I think of that. I don't think of, uh, you know, someone eating bagels and lox and living in uh, Crown Heights, right? There's also so many things we do that identify us as, as Jewish, right? The menorah being on the outside. Yeah. In addition, uh, a mezuzah, right? It's like, hey, this is a Jewish home. This is right. an announcement. Whether it's a kippah or otherwise, mm -hmm. it's, you know. Or even our names that, you know. Is right, like oftentimes with very, us. yeah. You know, and that, that's Very also Jewish. a conversation of people saying that uh, Jews are, are white passing, right? Some Jews may have light skin, and if they hide their kippah and Magad David, maybe in certain periods they might come off as white passing, although it didn't really help much for the Jews that were living in Europe, which were more white Jews in terms of their skin color than others, they were still found and persecuted. And I would say to that, I mean, the conversation of white passing is much more nuanced, because if you look on a list of names, and you have uh, Yair Cohen, and Shoshana Levy, and all these different Jewish names, and then you have name of, uh, let's say, a Native American, that's like uh, Joe Smith, uh, and a black person, Crystal Jackson, right? Those are white passing names, right? Given, of course, these are names of slave masters that were passed on to them because their identity was stolen. But on this list of names, who's white passing and who's not? If you go through uh, a, an, an, right. a, like an, a community, right? And you see mezuzot on houses and on other houses you don't have mezuzot, people there could be white, could be black, could be Native American, could be whatever they want. But in this situation, they're not passing as anything, but Jews are sticking out. So right. there are many experiences of Jews sticking out beyond what other people experience that most of other societies don't understand of what we actually go through. Through. So this is also part of the conversation. So, so to have. play devil's advocate with that, yeah, um, your message is be more proud, stick out more. Yes, again. Um, but most also, of the attacks on Jews are against Orthodox Jews, who are very obviously um, Jewish. 
I would say it depends. If you go to college campuses, it's not necessarily on them. I think it depends on which community. Um, but yeah, when people who are angry towards the Jewish people think that it's okay to enact what they believe deep inside of them because no one has stood up, that's what happens when you're afraid of who you are. That's the consequence. Right? When I would go to France to visit my family, I was told the same thing. Tuck in your mag and David, put your keep on the side. Don't go out there and say who you are. And I refused to take off my mag and David. I didn't have the words to explain it. But today I realized that although taking off your mag and David might minimize the potential risk of you as an individual in the moment for of the getting attacked. For the collective, it's much more dangerous. But for the collective, it's far more dangerous than what it is to the individual. Very, very interesting. So um, it's, it's interesting how much this dovetails with a lot of the stuff I talk about, which is healing and trauma and, and everything else. So let's, can we dissect the, the difference between victim blaming and what you're suggesting, a, a certain level of, of personal responsibility? Where are people tripping up? Right. So if I, if I said something like the reason for why we're suffering is just because you exist and there's nothing you can do about it and you'll always suffer and, you know, stop being you and that's how you will, then that would be victim blaming. Right. But if I'm saying like, yes, this is not you that caused, like we didn't cause 6 million Jews to be killed. That's the Nazis that did that. We're not causing this anti-Semitism. That's the anti-Semites that are doing that. But we have the ability to prevent it if we unlock the ways of our ancestors that have taught us and the clear formula that has revealed itself throughout history. If we apply and put in the right variables into the formula that we know work, it's been proven, it's not a theory, then we can overcome. And it's very interesting that this whole dilemma that happened to me um, happened during Purim. And what's the story of Purim? All the Jews are divided. All of a sudden, Mordechai comes in and unites the Jews. And you know how he unites the Jews? Not by doing something, by doing nothing. He united the Jews by doing a fast. And just because we were united in the doing of nothingness, but in still we were united, that opened the doors for miracles. And one person, Queen Esther, was able to save the Jewish people. The story of uh, Purim is understanding that when we're united, miracles start to happen and even one person can save the Jewish people. So absolutely in any situation and in every situation, we will be able to overcome our traumas. And the reason it's so important is because I want to make it very clear and I'm going to say this on camera that maybe in 50 years, we don't have a Holocaust, we don't have another persecution. But if we do, that our descendants look back at this video and realizes we didn't do enough because we're not doing enough now. And I don't want the future generations to say, oh, don't blame the previous generations. They did enough. No, we're not doing enough we can do a lot more. And specific actions that you'd want people to take? It depends on the specific problems. Again, if we're talking individually, wherever you see a problem, go and spread light where there is. Collectively, as a Jewish people, we have to understand that the land of Israel is not just a territory to have a home in. Yes, it's our soulmate, it's our, it's our mother, it's our father, it's our children, it's who we are, but it's a vehicle. The Jewish people are the driver. The land of Israel is a vehicle. The destination is this concept of higher oneness of uniting the world, which we call Mashiach, right? And there's a direction we need to go towards and we need to start driving the car. We need to start using this vehicle to do something in this world and we're not. And when you don't use a car, the car goes bad. Let me throw, throw something at you. So right now we live in a, um, I've heard some people describe it as victim culture, right? You know, I've spoken a lot about... Um, child sexual abuse, for example, and how often people thought I would jump onto certain movements, you know, a, a Me Too movement or otherwise, when a lot of them were extremely, um, they had some kernels of truth in it, but a lot of them were um, poorly done, both within the Jewish community and, and, and globally. So looking at that as a problem on the world stage, right, where people, certainly we have to tell our story, Right, which is one aspect of it, but then getting stuck with and identifying in that story and say, I am forever a victim of whatever it was that, that happened to me, or whatever it was that happened to you or whatever it was that happened to us collectively. That may be what you're saying, or maybe one way it could be said is that the Jewish people have not resolved our own trauma surrounding the Holocaust. And maybe many of us are still stuck in the victim culture of that. And as a byproduct of that, the world on a global stage is magnifying that more and more and saying, I'm a victim of this, I'm a victim of that. And then more and more, the, lar the, the, the louder the victim, almost the more respect we give them when we're saying, no, hey, that's not the message. The message is and always will be personal responsibility and finding those parts in that story that could be changed next time or could be learned from. In other words, my question is, is it a stretch based on your worldview to say that so much of the culture, the victim culture that we see today may be because Jews have not 
gotten over their own victimhood. We have not gotten over our own victimhood related to the Holocaust. I don't think the reason for why everyone sees themselves as victims is because necessarily the Jews see themselves as victims. But I would say that the Jewish people, if they took on this responsibility of empowering the world and getting the world to wake up from the problems that the way things are seen, whether it's like caring only about materialism and individuality rather than the collective inhumanity of this world, um, then we have a responsibility to do something we're not. Let me give you an example. If someone chooses to be a doctor, right? It's their choice. It doesn't make them a good person or a bad person. They chose to be a doctor. And there's a flight um, that goes off and there's a person, you know, having a heart attack on the flight. And it just happens that there's a doctor who's a cardiologist. He's trained in being able to do something. And as the person is having a heart attack, the doctor looks at that person and says, I'm not going to do anything. You know, it's not the doctor that killed the patient, right. but the families and the witnesses will definitely externalize their pain and their trauma on that doctor saying, you could have saved my family and you didn't. So you're going to be the person that I'm going to blame and take out my pain on. Yes, sure. I'm not blaming anyone. Uh, what I'm saying is... It's, I'm saying that's why. Right, that's why empowering. Being, yeah. But in this same example, do you, th- do you think that we can do something about it in that way? Yes. In this, that it would change something downstream Absolutely. in the culture? Absolutely. We can do something. If we, if it's our responsibility to. And if we don't fulfill that responsibility, we will always get rejected for not doing so. You know, it's, it's, I'm not saying this uh, to, to justify anything. I'm saying it to understand the equation and the algorithm that exists within this universe in order to put in the right variables and to get the right outcome. My goal is for us to get us to the right outcome. Right. What I'm interested in is what, what's so interesting is that you've been able to do it um, on a story of something that happened to you at seven years old, right? When obviously it's victimless. I mean, how can you, it's not victimless. Obviously it's faultless to a seven-year-old. What could a seven-year-old have possibly done? And what could a seven-year-old possibly have had a responsibility to do prior to that time? But still in all, with all of those potential um, reasons to not take personal responsibility, you still found a way to look at that story and say, hey, there's a message here for us. We are not doing enough collectively in order to prevent these things. We're not unified enough. You know, what's interesting is that what my mom was wearing, her shirt, it was a shirt that she bought in Sfat that said Emet, truth. And so the Emet from him was shown. And when he showed his Emet, it revealed my Emet, my truth. And the truth from him was? The truth from him was that he had this huge Eight. hatred towards the Jewish people. And that he was just like, it. you know, revealed. I'm sure he had met other Jews before, but it was almost as seeing that word that made it revealed. And when I saw that, that made it revealed to me. And you know, there's many characters of Jewish history that went through similar situations, right? Moses witnesses a uh, slave master beating a Jewish slave. And that is his like epiphany, his wake up call that, you know, he can't just stand there anymore and he has to do something about it. Or Herzl, right? Who's a journalist who's very assimilated, even had like theories that we should convert to Catholicism in order to no longer be persecuted, goes to the Dreyfus trials in France, witnesses this public condemnation of a Jew just for being Jewish when the person wasn't even guilty and poof, that makes that person wake up right. sometimes we have to go through that to wake up the question is if that's plan B right that we have to go through anti-semitism to wake us up to spark us back to direction that we have to go through this moment but like Hitler this Hitler did that specifically right he went back three generations yeah but I'm saying if if this, he was very specific and not in targeting Jews that even didn't identify oh, for as him Jews. as all Jews. Like right. he, he went, he tried to go to Afghanistan to find lost tribes to kill them as and well. And going back several generations. Right. And he, he wasn't wanted about, to eradicate was anything. Wasn't assimilated or not assimilated. No, no, no. It was, so I'm, I'm saying you're a Jew. if anti-Semitism comes when the Jews assimilate, forget their purpose and, you know, hate each other and are divided and so on. Right. And then once we go through that, it always brings us back to a generation right after that is aware of who they are, that takes action, that becomes with themselves. If anti-Semitism is plan B, what is plan A? What is plan A that we no longer have to go through that in order to see the right way? But despite the fact that we did that, you're still saying that we didn't heal the trauma of it. No, we have not held the trauma from the Holocaust. I mean, people make that their identity. The Holocaust is their identity of being Jewish. It's like everything of being Jewish, you know, and, and, and when you talk about like, okay, well, what did we get wrong before the Holocaust? We didn't create the Holocaust, but... Let's learn from the past to make sure it's not going to happen again, right? If someone's going to come into my house and, you know, steal my things and do something like that, right? But But like next time (laughs) you want to know that I'm going to 
learn from that, that mistake. Like, okay, it wasn't my fault, but I didn't really have a good security system. I didn't have a fence. I didn't have cameras. You know, I didn't have, you know, those things that you would have, that now I realize those are things that I left open that lets the bad person that is responsible for the trauma. But because there are bad people out there, we have to prepare ourselves. We're not living in a world with only good. We're living in a world with bad. And if you are good, then you have to be prepared for the bad in order to prevent it from actually achieving what it wants to do. So, so your message is that if someone breaks into your home, lock the door. But if they get through anyway, break their knees. Yes, and next time, make sure that they can't even get down the block. I hope that those listening to this are inspired to find their personal responsibility in their own story, to find their mission, find their purpose. And if there's a trauma that needs to be healed personally, to, to do that. And that we start doing this more as a, a collective. As you're speaking, I'm thinking that you know, there's, in every culture, there's different ideas that we take for granted. And then this is like completely accepted. This is the way, the way it is. So, for example, in America, which is the dominant worldview that's permeated most of the world, is individualism. Right? Each man for, for, for himself on some level, each person in his way. There isn't so much of this idea of a people. I am part of a people, I am part of a culture, I am part of a, a group, a collective. There is the, the individual in society is respected above all. The collective is kind of, would you do some? would you sacrifice something for a collective? Sure, if you're a really nice guy, you would do that, but there's no requirement to. What we have to do is respect the individual. And what I find within Judaism, you know, when people ask, is it a, does it focus more on the individual or more on the collective? It's both. It found a way to... Harness both. And it's the Mangan David, the balance between the spiritual and the physical, the perfect balance between both. The triangle pointing up is to Shamaim, the spiritual, the triangle pointing down is to Adama, to the physical. And we can see in the East and the West, there's more physical here, more spiritual here, and we have to find the balance in this world, right? The, the left and the right are both expressions of the same truth. People who usually fall on the left care about human rights and justice and minorities, all great things. We will fall more on the right, security and identity. Also, why are we choosing one side or the next, right? The right? Like who together. decided that there was such a thing as left and right? Who decided that these are the boxes that we need to divide society by and then fight each other on things that we actually fundamentally, if we brought everything together, would both agree on? Yeah, I often say this about abortion. Abortion is such a divisive topic in the U.S. and people are voting on this. But when they've done polls, uh, they have very few percentage points, on single digit percentage points, I believe, on either end of the spectrum. What's the either end? Is one is abortion is appropriate in any and all circumstances at any and all time during pregnancy. That's one. And the other is that abortion is never appropriate under any circumstances at any time during pregnancy. There are very few people who live on either ends of those. But when we speak, we speak as if I'm pro-choice, anti-abortion, we <laughs> create this huge fight when really you can probably have less than 10% of society who really believe those. And you start talking with someone and someone's like first trimester, second, right? Like all these details start mattering very much to an individual in the discussion. I don't know where you are in the debate, but regardless of where you are, there's actually very few on either end of the spectrum. And many would like us to, would like us to believe that this is really a divided issue that, uh, that we have when we're not really that divided on the, on the topic and people are, you know, parading in the streets over a subject that if they actually spoke to the other person about 90% of people are going to... Uh, it's a big problem. We don't ever engage the other side and that we've become, not all, but many have turned into this position that the reason for why they're debating is to disprove the other side rather than to bring something to the table to bring truth. It's about using truth to weaponize against the other side rather than using truth to create a holistic reality of truth in this world. And it's also about the intention of how you come at it. Right. And oftentimes when we say a winner of a debate, it's who got the zinger in, not who actually persuaded the other side or found, or found um, common ground. Okay, I hope uh, those young and old are inspired by, uh, by your words. And I feel like you gave me a little bit more purpose on um, what I, I focus a lot, like on healing trauma, on um, people being comfortable sharing their stories and talking about what happened to them and overcoming it and finding something in that way. And you helped me see how that's a part of a larger piece to the puzzle. Because when we heal our trauma, then we can um, step into something much larger than our individual purpose, a collective purpose. Yeah. So I'll add even one more thing to that. You know, 
about a year and two months ago, we were three weeks in prison in Nigeria after going to visit so the Igbos yeah. and to document their life. The government is very anti the Igbos, so by nature saw us as a threat and imprisoned us for three weeks under very harsh conditions. And a lot of people ask me, you know, aren't you traumatized by like having to fight Boko Haram in prison and surviving? And it's like, no, I'm very proud of myself that I've overcome. I was faced with a challenge. God will never put you in a situation that you don't have the tools to overcome, right? Every situation that you're in, you have the ability to overcome. And I overcame, so I don't feel traumatized. I feel empowered by that situation. And, you know, it made me think of something. You know, a lot of people were asking me, do you have trauma? Do you have trauma? You need to see someone. And I was like, okay, I also did the army, you know, a few years back. And I have friends who lived in the same situation and I could see some people came out completely okay and some people have PTSD. So why is it that two people saw the same situation, were in the same place, had the same training and one comes out messed up and one comes out okay? And when I looked at the individual cases of the two friends that I had that had a bad case of PTSD, it was all about how they dealt with the moment in the moment. In the moment them, themselves, they were shocked. They were like in a moment of shock. They didn't know what to do. They were afraid. So when they relive that experience, they're reliving those emotions. Whereas another person felt strong, I'm capable, I'm uh, you know, invincible, I'm all going to overcome, I'm going to survive. And when they think and they remember of that experience, they remember those emotions. So trauma has a lot to do, not always, but has a lot to do with how you experience the moment in the moment, which then affects how you remember that moment and how you perceive that moment. I have to think about what I think about that. However, what I would say is that even someone who did experience it in Can a moment, still overcome. Difficult way, Absolutely. right? There is a way to um, to to shake that off, yeah. so to speak. And what it is actually, um, there's a podcast that I, you know, I've always wondered like, what is healing? What does it mean to heal? I've healed. Like, what is this? What is this thing? It feels so ambiguous. And one day I hope, and I think that they will have the tools to show us that trauma is something that truly lives inside us. There's a a, a space where it exists. Maybe it changes certain brain chemistry. Maybe it changes something in, in, in the body. Obviously you can have, um, you know, an acupuncturist or those will talk about energetic blockages, but we don't really have a way to, we have to release energetic blockages, but we don't really have a way to measure it at this stage as far as I, as far as I know, but there's something that happens and healing for a long time to me felt very esoteric. And there was one, one person who I've spoken to, uh, spoken about a few times on this podcast. His name is Adam Young, who I found has an ability to explain these concepts in a very um, down to earth way. And one of the things he says is that to heal something, we have to go back to that original state, which is not too much different. Go back emotionally with some, oftentimes with someone, if we do it alone, we may get dysregulated and we may just get to a place where we can't handle it and freak out that's not the space. We may get completely numb. It may be so painful that we go to a space where I remember I had a friend um, who was struggling um, a lot with porn and sex addiction and I was helping him through it. And I asked him to tell me his story going back to his earliest memories. And there was a lot of sexual abuse in his story. And uh, I had him write it out and then read it to me. So as he was reading to me his, his story, it, he was so dispassionate about what was happening. And I stopped him at some point. I'm like, you're talking about a child, four or five years old, who was abused by an older brother and then abused by his older brother's friends and like such a horrible story. And you can be talking about the weather, not of today, of six months ago. Like you're so disconnected from this. And that's the other way we go where we can't completely live in it. And Adam Young talks about the importance of healing to be able to go back to that story in a way that's real, in a way that we feel it, that we're not dysregulated, we're not numb. And then through that, find the, like the, Someone like the light that's calling us. Like, where's that, where's that kernel of truth? When I talk about, when I think about my own journey, because I don't have yours at all. I lived in victimhood for many, many years. I kept it as a secret that no one can know. I was sexually abused. Like, if I talk about that, that story, there was more trauma than that. But if I talk about that story, because um, I think people can understand it better, it was a secret for 15 years. And then afterwards, it was a secret for most people, but not some people. And then... It was, uh, there was an identification with it for a while. And now when I look back at it, it's like, hey, my ch when I was in that victimhood, it was everything was perfect until this monster came and interrupted my childhood. And now when I look back, no, everything was not perfect, not even close. And the proof that it wasn't perfect is that the first time it happened, I didn't go to my parents to tell them. And me as a parent today, if God forbid something like that happened to my child and I didn't tell them, and I, I wasn't told, I would say, hey, what's going on with my child that he doesn't trust me enough to tell me that story? 
So not to blame my parents in any way, but just to highlight what was. What was was a situation that was dysfunctional. Now here came someone who on the one hand took advantage of the dysfunction, but at the other hand shined light on it, shined truth on it. This is what was going on. There was a dysfunction here. And then I kept going back for three years. What was that about? And when I was really able to look at my story honestly, this person who abused me was not someone who derailed me, was someone who shined light on the dysfunction and helped me to start speaking truth about it. So when I first walked into therapy, I was, woe is me, I was sexually abused, and that's what allowed me to be comfortable enough to walk into a therapist's office, which for me was a big secret for a while. Eventually it became, oh wow, this is... This happened to me as a way to communicate all these other things that were wrong that now I have an opportunity to correct, to rectify hopefully with my family of origin, with my future family and talk about it and let, let other people know most kids who are sexually abused are not sexually abused in a vacuum. They're not. If you talk about a, a woman who was jogging in a park and was raped, maybe victimless, maybe not victimless, maybe, um, I'm using the wrong word, I keep saying that, maybe faultless completely. There's nothing to... Yeah, there's nothing to do over there, okay? You've ran this, other people have ran it, pulled into the woods. But a child who went back to their abuser three years in a row, come on. A child who was groomed for months and their parents didn't notice that, how? And everyone around them didn't notice it? There's obviously a, a malaise in society. A lot of people want to blame it on the rabbis or the leaders or everything else. It's all of us. There's someone crying in pain and 50,000 people walk past them, completely ignored it, couldn't feel it because we're distracted by our own stuff. And then come these very strong reminders, sexual abuse, grooming, or what you spoke about, anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, and say, okay, what are we missing? What do we, what do we need to do? And that's where I think the personal um, responsibility comes in. It's not so much... It, I think it comes from a worldview of everything is essentially good. But sometimes I need a medicine. Everything is essentially good. Everything is driving us to a place of eventual goodness. But sometimes I need a medicine. Sometimes I need a surgery. And when we have a surgery, sometimes it hurts more in the short, short, short term in order for us to eventually brought, be brought to a place of healing. And when we don't have that worldview, which is a godless worldview, when we don't, and a good God worldview, then something happens and we say, why did this happen to me? There were, all these, there were all these other people who were walking by who this didn't happen to. I say, no, 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 there were all these other people who it didn't happen to because I can do something about this. And there was something specific here that A, I can do something and B, that was going on. Those two, I'm empowered to do something about it and I'm going to be honest about the problem, the real problem that existed. And I think that's a lot of the similarities. I felt strongly when I heard you talk that I got to bring you on this, even though it's not, I don't really focus on anti-Semitism. I don't really focus on those things, but the personal and collective, I think is something that we have to start thinking more about yeah, our personal journey and the collective journey that we have. I took a class in university. It was a psychology class. And the teacher was talking about a woman in an abusive relationship with her husband and how there are three ways in which a woman can respond. Mm -hmm. Number one is after this happens to stand up, fight back, remove herself from the situation, get that person in trouble, make sure that, that doesn't, person doesn't do it to her or anyone else again. Number two is to make excuses for it. Oh, it was just one time. You didn't really mean it. Oh, I was just drunk. Oh, it was just mad. And number three is to blame themselves. No, no, it was my fault. I should have done this. I should have done that. And we see the same thing for the collective of the Jewish people, that parallel of trauma. Some Jews stand up and fight back. Most Jews make excuses. Oh, it's over there. Oh, it's against Israel. I'm Jewish. I'm not Israeli. Kind of pushing it off. And then you have some Jews from the Torah Kalta, from the religious side, to the secular side, the far leftist Jews, who blame themselves for their own trauma and say, no, no, we're supposed to be suffering. No, no, we're going to stand with our oppressors subconsciously, not even knowing that they actually want us dead as well, thinking that if we go and stand with them, that they're going to stand with us. And what do the professors speak about as the optimal way? So the optimal way is, is number one. However, when we look at the woman that's blaming herself for being beat by her husband, we don't look at that as a self-hating woman, right? We look at it as a woman who's been broken and is hurt who's that traumatized. And, and that we have to help. So when we look at Jews that go against Israel in their own collective, we cannot call them self-hating Jews. We have to understand that this is how they've processed their trauma. Traumas Understood. that's passed down generation to generation, not just in their experience, but generational trauma that we hold on to. And as those who take option number one, we have even more of a responsibility to go and help them. Okay, so I think in sum total for all of this, I got to interview your parents. <laughs> <laughs>